Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Today, we'll be discussing psychology for development. I feel like psychology is an important aspect of development because a lot of a person's ability to work towards greatness, to achieve great things is tied to their mentality. And I feel like there's so many things that because as people who are coming from a background of oppression, either through colonialism or neo-colonialism, there's a lot of healing that needs to happen. Also, as people who are coming from developing countries, there's a lot of things that we've been told about who we are, what our limits are, what we can achieve. And I feel like a lot of us, a lot of us have internalized that and think that development or innovation is for people that are outside the continent of Africa or outside of Zambia. We really do not believe that we are capable of achieving greatness. We are capable of innovating to a world standard and we're, we're capable we're coming from a background where we've been taught, we've been taught to hate ourselves. We've been taught to look down on ourselves and it's time to just change the way that we view ourselves and we view development. So our guest today is a psychologist. And in addition to that, she's an entrepreneur and she's an etiquette therapist. And she's going to explain what etiquette therapy is and all of that stuff but i just thought that while we are waiting for her to get on i would give a little bit of background to um my perspective on psychology for development and the importance um whatever you believe you are going to do you're going to do so if we continue as a people to believe that we are always going to be on the back hand or we're always going to be the ones that are underdeveloped, the ones that are always begging, the ones that are always on the receiving end of aid, that is exactly what is going to happen. And it's time that we, we change our mentality. And, you know, there's so many dynamics behind why as a country and as a continent, we are underdeveloped. Um, corruption, for example, is one of the reasons why we're underdeveloped. And even corruption has a lot to do with the mentality, um, the mental headspace we're in. I feel like also extreme poverty also puts people in a particular type of headspace. And those are the type of things that I would like us to discuss with our guest tonight. So just as we will continue to wait for her to come on, if you can hear me clearly and you have any thoughts regarding what I just said, please just post a comment for me so that we can interact a little bit before our guest comes on. We're just waiting for our guests to come on. While we're on the topic of psychology, I feel like um, how we view psychological issues, for example, our mental health is also another aspect of, or an aspect that is going to determine how far we get. Um, when we're talking about health, um, health is very holistic, so it doesn't only 
include our physical health it's, it's also about the headspace that we are in i feel like as a culture and as a people we neglect our mental health and there's many people that are mentally ill and are not getting the type of help that they need and that is affecting them from being their best selves um there's also a lot of people that have learning disabilities for example and because we do not have an education system that is able to incorporate and accommodate these people there's a lot of people that are at school and believe they are dao but it's 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 just that they're not able to learn within the framework and within the education system that we have um so i'm i'm really eager to get into that as our guest comes on just waiting for her Okay, so she's on now. Hello, Natasha. How are you? Hello, hello. I apologize for my tardiness. It was crazy traffic coming um, the states and, and, and of course, in D.C. So moving from one location to the next. But I'm so glad to be on today. Thank you so much. Okay, are you able to hear me? I think you're breaking a little bit. Yes, I can, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I'm delighted to be before you today. Can you hear me? You frozen, Tanesh. Hello? Tanashe? I guess we're having some technical difficulties. Let me go get the um. Hello, are you there? Natasha, I think your mic is muted. Natasha, are you there? Your mic is muted. is muted and I don't know if, if it's me.
Natasha, are you there? Okay, um, I think Natasha seems to be having some technical difficulties. Um, we'll just give her a few moments and... Can you hear me now? Okay, now yes, no, I can hear you. Your mic was muted. Oh my goodness. Yeah, because for some reason, I don't know, I was kept pressing it and pressing it and it wasn't working. Okay, now it's working and I can hear you just fine. Oh, How's perfect. your day? It's I know it's, okay. it's going well. It's going well. Just busy, busy, busy. But you know what? It is exciting. I am so glad to be on the call with you guys and your viewers. This is exciting. Me too. I'm, I'm so glad we could finally do this. I know it's it's afternoon over there. Yes. Um, it's nighttime here. Um, okay. Thank you so much for making the time to do this live stream. I can't wait for our discussion. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, Tanisha. So um, did you want Tanache. me to... Tanache. 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 Yes. So, I mean, you start, unless you want your viewers to know who I am, I can just, you know, I can yes. tell you a little bit about who and, I am. And I was going to say, you, you, you can start by giving everyone a brief introduction of who you are and um, what you do, where you're from, and that sort of stuff. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I'm excited to be here. My name is Natasha Paris Amand. I am originally from Brooklyn, New York, and my family is from Haiti. So I am a Haitian American, born in the States, very first generation in the States. And I'm, when I say I'm super duper excited to be with you, it's because you know, here we are, you know, across across the world, right? Across the world, being able to interact and really, you know, share some great things. So, so most people always ask, you know, what is it that you do again, right? So I am, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm an etiquette therapist. So basically, my title is the etiquette therapist. And oftentimes, the question is, what is an etiquette therapist, right? Well, it was a term that I have coined because of the fact that I have been, um, I have a vast amount of experience. First, so there were two, let me just kind of say this. So for the most part, there were two worlds that I was living, coexisting, right? I was living um, mm -hmm. simultaneously. And the first world was the world of the fashion industry. Um, I was a stylist, a makeup artist for a very long time. I modeled for some time. But more importantly, I, my goal had been to really work with individuals who were who were primarily, um, you know, fashion models. And I worked with, you know, individuals along the lines of styling and things of that nature. And, you know, so that was my world. That was my world. And I also did like workshops as it relates to being able to speak as it related to being able to, um, you know, for the most part, just, you know, just be your best self. But then at mm -hmm. the same time, you know, while I was doing all this fabulous stuff in the fashion industry, I had parents who came to this country and their goal was to really you know, support and give myself and my siblings a better life. And so they were like, okay, I understand. I know you love the, the creative arts and I know that you love dance and, and, and styling and makeup artistry, but we came to give you a better education. So what are you doing? What is, what is this stuff that you're doing? Right. And so my, my family, you know, of course they were like inspiring me, encouraging me to continue to go to school. So I started um, actually really focusing on the, the world of psychology. And so throughout my experience and all of my, you know, my, my licensing, I am a therapist as well. So I'm a mental health therapist, helping individuals emotionally, um, dealing with mental health issues that really plague people around the world. So it's not something that is only committed and dedicated to a small group of people. Okay. So, so, I had been living these these two lives uh, simultaneously coexisting, but finally, you know, about maybe about six, seven years ago, I had made a decision to bring those two worlds together. 
because those two worlds were living in tandem. And so hence the name, the etiquette therapist, because I'm not just working with individuals about their parents and how they present themselves to the world, but I also support individuals emotionally because I often say you can be a dressed up mess. You can look the part, you can look great, but emotionally there's some other things that are going on. There are other things that mm -hmm. are going on. So, so with that said, you know, hence the, 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 the coined term, the etiquette therapist. And so, and then I also, and then, so I, and then just maybe about two years ago, I also added the piece about not just what you look like, not what you just emotionally are dealing with, but also how are you dealing, how, how are you focusing on entrepreneurship, right? Entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. to, you know, your finances. So we're working on the outside, the inside of their finances. So that's what I did. Okay, great. Um, I, I really like how you found your niche, I guess, and you were able to bring together two industries that people would typically not think go together. And I feel like that's a really great baseline for the discussion that we are having today. Um, psychology for development. So uh, you have your roots in Haiti, and um, I'm. In, and one of the things, one of the narratives that has forever been told about Africa is that we are the the poor continent who are constantly in need of help and support, and you know, um, hand me downs from of the world we really cannot innovate things for ourselves and we're not capable of doing so much but that's not true um even when people have the you know the mentality of africa it's usually very negative africa is not seen as a place of plenty um except to those people that want to plunder from us and i felt like etiquette therapy is really an important part is go oh, is going to be a very important part in our as a really important part for us to, to help us with our development and for us to, to enhance ourselves. Um, my first question coming from that sort of background is um, what are the main factors that influence a person's mentality? Well, you know, I'm gonna be honest with you. It really has all to do with, it has all to do with, um, you know, how a person, how a person is raised. It really does, you know, and I think that it's your culture, it's how you're raised, your belief systems. Um, it's not just your belief system, but it's your ability to process information and see the world how you see yourself. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to developing that belief system, it really encourages one to, you know, because it's, you know, what has been taught to you. Who are the first loves that you fall in love with? And those are usually your parents. And mm -hmm. so, and based on that, that's what, the, that's what creates the person who you see in front of you. But of course, there are other circumstances and other contributing factors. I love what you said about one, your belief system and the way that you were raised. You know, like one of the most disheartening things I remember about growing up is how people would tear down anyone who tried to be innovative, who tried to dress up outside of the room, who, tr who just tried to do things. And, you know, there were many times where there are many times where genius is mistaken for mental illness and yeah. people suppress um suppress people's innovations because it just seems so out of the ordinary. Um, another thing I don't like particularly about some of the cultures I've witnessed growing up is, for example, the moment that you start to think highly of, about yourself or, you know, speak highly of yourself, there's people around you that translate that, that you translate that into saying you are better than them. I think mm -hmm. it's important to begin to readjust our mentality because I think a positive mindset and a positive mentality is so important when it comes to achieving greatness. And then also something else that I will say is sort of like an issue is the fear of failure. So um, growing up, I've witnessed people put people down because they tried to do something great and then they failed. And, you know, I think many of the great inventors have failed even, even when, they act they ultimately succeeded when if they told you they would tell you about their failures how do you think we could begin to readjust that mentality on a wide scale 
Okay, so well, you know, a lot of it is, you know, it has, I mean, because readjusting people's mentality is really being able to get the message across, right, about mm -hmm. individuality and uniqueness. Mm -hmm. And being able to say it's okay, because oftentimes when children are um, growing up, they are looking at being part of a larger group, which is normal, right? We understand that that's very mm -hmm. normal. However, what needs to also mm -hmm. happen is, is that, so this is normal when you see a child wanting to be part of a group and not wanting to be separate. And when they become, mm -hmm. when they realize that they're unique in some way, other children begin to bully them about being different. Okay, like you said that there are mm -hmm. who, you know, they may, they may, um, they may really subdue their genius because of the fact that they know it's different. And so one of the best ways to support that and, and support individuality and support uniqueness is to be able mm -hmm. to have wide level of discussion, promotion, advertisement as it relates to mm -hmm. it's okay to be unique. Being unique is one of the beautiful, best gifts that God has given us. Because yes, we may, we're all part of the human race, but because you're different, that's what makes us so beautiful. And having, and I've, and you know, which is interesting enough is that a lot of skincare um, companies are starting to get involved in that level of advertisement, right? Where you'll see people of different shades and saying, it's okay to be different or not just skincare advertisements, but you'll see other fashion you know, um, segments and outlets saying it's okay to be different no matter what size you are, right? Whether you're th a size two versus a size 10 versus a size 22, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think what would need to happen and, and to consistently happen is saying it's okay to be unique and having that message broadcast across all advertisements and outlets. I really love what you said about um, embracing individuality and uniqueness because I feel like this is a conversation that um, needs to be had in so many facets. So I'll give you an example of one of the, the things that prevents development in Africa is one of the things, the major things is reg regionalism and tribalism. So people start to fight one another because they have di different cultures and religion is also one of the, these things. Rather appreciate what is different and learn to coexist despite the difference people start to fight one another and start to attack one another because they view things differently or they have different preferences you said something um very profound um you see and i'm going to quote your exact words you said readjusting mentality is about getting I mean, uh, readjusting mentality is about getting the message across. Um, so essentially what we need to begin to do is to get the message across that it's okay to be different. And it, it's in those differences that you can actually create a, a great product. So you can we can get to a point where we build a formidable economy and a formidable continent because we have embraced our differences. We're too busy um, fighting each other and bickering over what we're different about rather than seeing the value or seeing the gold in our differences. I really like what you said. Um, my next question for you is, are there any psychological reasons that lead to corruption or to corrupt behavior? And I'm asking this question because I feel like one of the reasons why development is very stifled on the continent and in emerging nations is there's a lot of corruption. Co corruption is actually, it's a pandemic and it's, it's become so cancerous and the money that should be spent on healthcare or education or, or actual development related activities goes into people's personal bank accounts and is just spent on personal desires. So is there anything that psychologically leads to this type of corrupt behavior? Well, you know, a, a lot of it, and, and I, that's a fantastic question, like what leads to corrupt behavior and selfish behavior? Because that's ultimately mm -hmm. what it is, right? You're not looking for the, 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 the self-development, the unity of individuals and being able to share and, and prosper together as a tribe. And I love the word tribe, and I've been using it for, for the past month you know because what i notice is that tribal 
people within a tribe that they're they're all towards they're working towards one common goal, and that's being able to prosper and 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 build right individually and ask and collectively. And so when you ask about you know what what really is the root because that's what I'm hearing. What is the root of corruption as it relates to groups of people? And I'm going to say this, and, 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 it, and it hurts to say it, but a lot of it is the acceptance of the corruption, right? So, mm. you know, so there's the acceptance that it's okay to be, it's okay amongst the elite to corrupt those who are less, um, mm -hmm. who, who are less, um, who has less, I should say. I don't want to use the word superiority and inferior, right? But those individuals who are of the working class. So it's okay to take advantage, right? So there's that level of acceptance that happens. And if it wasn't accepted, then it wouldn't be done. But then when you mm -hmm. go deeper into all of that is then you have individuals who, you know, you know, in my in my world, when you talk about selfishness, you talk about people mm -hmm. who, who who feel this level of narcissism. Right. Narcissism, which is that whole level of it's all about me, 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 me. It's never about the whole person. It's always about mm -hmm. me, me, what can I benefit and how can you benefit me? It's never about me benefiting you. And so that is when you see levels of corruption running rampant and becoming a pandemic, it is because there's a level of acceptance within that higher level of elitism that allows mm -hmm. it to become widespread and it becomes like a piranha. It becomes a piranha eating away at all of the things that have brought these individuals to the level where they are. Right, because they didn't get there by themselves. They got there because of the people, and they lost mm. sight of that. And once they got there, then that's that level of superiority that comes with narcissism, right? And also the inability. This is good, right here. The inability to be empath, um, empathetic, and sympathetic. Mm. The inability to be empathetic and sympathetic. If I were in their shoes. How would I feel if I were treated mm -hmm. in such a great and grandiose manner? Mm -hmm. what, how would I feel? And so when you lose touch with your feelings and how others feel, primarily how others feel, then you get lost in all of that. And, it's, and it becomes difficult to get out because now you have this mm -hmm. level of acceptance from those who are among you, right? But then, and then you have that level of superiority that comes with it, and then you, and then you completely become callous, and you lose sight of why you were put in that place or that position. You lose sight of that, and those people who you're working supposed to be working for, now you see them as nothing more than something in the way, and you don't have mm. the empathy for them or sympathy. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know what what I find interesting and because like I've actively been involved in like the governance and like the political realm for like the past five years. I I've I've learned that there's it's not that certain people lose sympathy. It's it's that um that's who they always were and they did give a message of being sympathetic um because they knew that's what the, they wanted the people to hear and obviously is not true across the board there are many people that are very genuine and very honest and like you say they just became um they just lost touch with reality and then i want to bring two other dynamics so we have we also have a group of let's say political elite who come from the line of political elite people and they have this they there's there's such a disconnect between them and the life they live their everyday life the people in their circles and the people on the ground the actual people suffering and then there's a different dynamic on of the people that once were in those shoes um what came from like impoverished backgrounds and they were suffering and they felt like well, no one cared about me. So now that I, I have access to this, why should I care about no one else? So how do we now begin to change those mentalities and get people to actually really care about the real things? Because like, like and right, like you said, it's, it's, there's no one size fits all um, 
solution because even the problems and multiple people will do the same thing but for dif like different reasons so I, i'd just like to hear your thoughts on that well you know what you know tanache it really you know how do you change people's perceptions mm. Right? How do you change pe people's perceptions about the world that they live in and how and and the the work that they do? Mm -hmm. And so, you again, it is being able to really get in the mind of individuals on top, right? Because I'm mm -hmm. sure within your country, you guys have definitely have done you know some enormous work around being able to change the thoughts and the perception mm -hmm. of how people see the working class or the people that they're working for. And so what I would say, and, 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 and basically I would say that you might have more of the answer than I do, because it is about coming together and being organized as a, as a group of people and gaining and demanding the attention demanding that this shall no longer continue, that this mm. is not acceptable, it's downright unacceptable, and that mm. you have the power, you do not. And so, you know, it's, and, and it's, it's a collective effort, right? It really is a collective effort of people mm. deciding that this is what they're not going to tolerate. And in not tolerating that, they will do whatever it takes in order to make sure that it does not continue. Okay, so here mm. in the States, and, and many of you are very familiar with the civil rights movement. Okay, with mm -hmm. Martin Luther King and, and, and how blacks and whites were being treated in, you know, unequally. Right. There was large amounts of inequality that was happening. And so one of the things that they decided to do was they decided it was called the boy, the, the, um, the boycott and the, you know, the the busing. Right. What they decided that they were no longer going to support financially the transportation services within the country. OK, mm -hmm. they had made a decision that everyone, no matter no matter whether you had your you had to work and your job was. 10 miles away, if not 20 miles away, you made a decision that you were going to either walk or you were going to carpool with someone. But you had decided that you were not going to financially mm -hmm. support an establishment that was there to put their foot on your neck. And so with that said, they understood that money had power. And if I am mm -hmm. going to continue to support you, you have to be able to provide me with my needs and be able to see what it is that my people want. And if you don't do that, we're going to take something from you. So it was, mm -hmm. a, and, 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 and that in itself was magnificent because here you had a collective group of individuals making a decision that they were going to be on one accord and they were going to do it together without having individuals saying, well, you know what? No, that's mm -hmm. not going to work. I, I, I need to work, and so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, disregard what you said as it relates to getting on a bus. Mm. So I say this all to say that there are there's power in numbers. Mm. There's I think power, definitely there's power in numbers. So you know you can begin to change the you know change the hearts and minds, but Martin Luther King said that you got to change the laws first. To, to mm. make a difference, and then a thing, the hearts and minds will begin to change right after, right? Because it takes more of a process to change the hearts and minds of people. But when you put laws in place and you make decisions collectively, then you are on the right track. And then eventually the hearts and minds of people will begin to change. I hear you. And you've said some very profound things. Just, just to backtrack. A bit. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase your words when I asked you about corruption as the issue. And I think you're very right in saying that we are accomplices to the corruption because if we are accepting the corruption and we are not banding together, because like you've said, there's strength in our numbers and we're not banding together to stand up against the corruption. And also, I think there's, there's also a very, we, we use corruption, we started to use corruption at the top as an excuse for our personal internal corruption because I've seen corruption happen at multiple levels, not just at the top, even at the bottom. So people 
there's the certain corruption that happens within Zambia that has nothing to do with the government. So Ooh. it's just people yeah. at their jobs, people in their day-to-day -day lives. And it's become so ingrained as a mentality. And you spoke about like, like narcissistic tendencies and um, yeah, narcissistic tendencies and just people just having this like elitist mentality. Um, I think I'm going to far, go as far to say as and assert the fact that sometimes the leaders that we have are an indication of our society because sometimes all you need for evil to prevail is for people to stand up and do nothing. So if we're not standing up against the corruption that is happening, we're not putting a stop to it, we are accomplices. And that says a lot about who we are. Um, Absolutely. Can I, can I, can I, I, throw, can I throw in a sure. quote? Like what you just said, right? If you stand for nothing, you will fall for mm. anything. Martin Luther King said this, and it's, it's so mm. pertinent and so on time for everything. Because here in the U.S., we're dealing with police brutality and, with, and, and of course, Black Lives Matter, that mm -hmm. we are not given the same rights, equal rights, based on our white counterpart. And so mm. here you have is that it's so vital that you stand for something because if you just stay silent and do nothing, as you said, and do mm. nothing, you become you become part of the problem. Mm. More importantly, I think it's it's more than just doing nothing, but I think doing the right thing because you gave an example of the boycott of the bus system. Um, people decided that if they were going to get a change, an amount of personal discomfort and personal sacrifice was going to need to happen. But I find that with our generation and with our, as far as saying, as even our community, the black community, it almost feels like we're not ready to do the necessary sacrifice and uh, give the necessary commitment to what is required. Because like you're saying, so, if they 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 decided during the civil rights movement that they would not keep giving these people their money and be accomplices, so they decided, okay, if they're going to listen to us, we're going to have to stop giving them their money. But it 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 didn't come easy. It came at at a personal sacrifice to them. I'm sure many of them had to wake up earlier. Many of them have had to go without certain luxury and comfort and all of that sort of thing. And it, it ties back to what I'm saying with corruption is a lot of people find themselves par um, as parties to corruption because maybe they can't meet their basic needs with their entire salary or something like that. So are we really willing to bring a change, even if it means personal sacrifice and personal cost to us, which, which, which makes me beg the question, do we really want what we say we want? That's good. That's good. So that's, I think that's interesting. I, although I also wanted to ask something um, with our leaders, because I think corruption is rampant across the African continent and everywhere in the world, to be honest, in politics. Do we need to force get these people to start to see therapists and stuff to help them deal with their narcissism and, you know, their selfishness and, and you know, the, the stuff that leads to, to corruption? I don't know. Because it, it seems like lots of them have things to unpack. Yes, absolutely. And you know what? And it and as it relates to not just the poli you know, the politicians at the top, it is people overall, because what we know for sure mm -hmm. is that therapy, receiving therapy and admitting that something is wrong is taboo. Mm -hmm. You cannot dare say there's something wrong. That's Right. You cannot dare say that there's something going on in your life that is not stable. And so it is not just at the top, but it's also at the bottom where people mm -hmm. are. There are many people across the globe. The number one, number one diagnosis across the globe is depression. Mm. depression. A, a, a high level of sadness sullenness that comes from not being met or levels of trauma which is very mm -hmm. very rampant across the globe where people have experienced levels of trauma whether it is 
genocide, whether it is, you know, rape, whether it is, you know, violence, mm -hmm. whether it is disease, and actually seeing it up close and mm -hmm. personal. And, and, and saying, okay, this is part of my life and I'm going to accept it. But the mind knows, the spirit knows that it's unacceptable. And so what mm. happens is, is that that trauma remains there, undealt with, and it begins to grow and grow and grow. What leads to levels of depression, which then says, okay, I'm dealing with these uncomfortable feelings for what I'm going to do. I'm, instead of dealing with my feelings, I'm going to stop and put my, my, my foot on the necks of others in order for me to feel better about me. So it be, it's a cycle. It's a process. It's a cycle that many people don't really understand or I should say are willing to accept. And so if you're talking about politicians, let's talk about the whole, not just the politicians, but the people who are voting them in and who are making mm -hmm. experiences for them. Because if you are of a healthy, strong mind, you know that what is happening is incorrect. It's, it's unacceptable. And so it is being able to accept what is going on in your world and say, okay, I know what's happening. I need to get and seek help. Mm -hmm. Because then I can begin to heal. Because once I heal, then I can begin to heal those around me by encouraging mm. levels of support, by saying you can talk about it, by saying that we, we will not ridicule you or criticize you for being human. Mm. For being human and having frailties and not just saying you have to be subhuman and, and, and you have to be powerful at all times. Because I think that once that message is met and received, then you will begin to see healing across the world. Mm -hmm. But there are so many people who are unwilling to really admit what is happening, what, or what has happened and heal from it and move forward. Mm. And I think you've said it so beautifully, and I'm going to quote you. You said, admitting there's something wrong is taboo. And I think this goes across the board. One of my life's passions is neocolonialism, because like with most of with most of our African countries, we are free on paper, but we have so many systems that still oppress us. And when it comes to the reality, like you're saying, admitting that there's something wrong is taboo. No one wants to admit. We blame everything. We blame governments. We blame corruption. And then on a personal level, like you said, um, when it comes to depression, um, in Zambia, for example, that we, we I've, I've seen around that there's, there's, I think I'll just say it bluntly, people have become alcoholics. And we've gotten to a point where as a nation we are glorifying alcoholism but when you really begin to decipher what is happening it's because of everything happening that is making people depressed people are not acknowledging that everything is not okay and they're being human because i think we've be we've begun to hold each other as human beings to standards which are not human and when none of us can reach those standards we get depressed so I think you you saying that is is very profound. And what she said is that let me just read this comment from Sonda Mapemba. She says also consider the stereotypes associated with mental illness and getting psychological care in Zambia. It becomes difficult for people who actually need the help to not only acknowledge it but to actively seek it. So even in instances where we have people that want the help, there's there's a very there's very limited access to mental health um, help and support and even awareness. Um, people will blame it on demons or, you know, you being, um, what word am I, be, you being bewitched. You like, right. they'll blame it on so many things before they actually acknowledge that there's a mental illness. Yes, yes. And, so, and that is true, absolutely. And I think this now, this leads into um, our, our next question very nicely. And I think you already answered part of it. How does 
oppression affect people psychologically? Because obviously we're coming from a background where we've been colonized. We're still being colonized. Um, we are at risk of possible recolonization with China. Um, you know, there's, there's there's so much oppression that goes on with with you know young people with women. Like there's there's so many layers to this oppression. So what are the effects of this oppression? Wow, when you're talking about oppression and the effects of it, oppression is a lasting effect. It can, it mm -hmm. reaches generations to generations to generations, you know, and, and I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, I mean, the colonization. I mean, we know this, we know this. And, 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 and in order to get people to do what you've asked them to do, you have to get them in their mind. Mm. You have you have to you have to chain their mind. Mm -hmm. you chain their mind, then they begin to do or create habits. They I should say they create behaviors that then became mm -hmm. habits, and that's passed on from generation to, to generation. And so, mm -hmm. when you're asking about the question is how to do it, I mean, and, and, and please support me on this if I'm incorrect in saying this, but the question is how do we support or should, how do we deal with oppression? Is that is that really the, the gist of the question? The question is, if, if you could give me from your um, professional background, yes. how oppression affects people psychologically. Oh my goodness. Okay, so just imagine, so I, I love analogies. Just imagine mm -hmm. a lion being locked in a cage, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just follow me. A lion being locked in a cage and given dog food, okay? Mm -hmm. Dry, crunchy stuff. This lion was locked in a cage and given crunchy stuff since they were cubs or a cub. Mm -hmm. Then now the lion has now aged the, because lions can live a very long life. And so now mm -hmm. 10, 10 years before their death, they carry this, this, this lion that has now grown from being, you know, 30 pounds, 40 pounds to now 250 or 300. Mm -hmm. And don't quote me on the, the, the weight of the lion, right? But now this lion has grown to be mature enough, even, even at its at its elderly age. And so you take mm. that lion and now you, you put him in the wild. You open up the cage and you say to the lion, go. Mm -hmm. That lion would have to be pushed out of that cage. Now that lion is in the wilderness, in the wild, and there are hyenas back and forth. Mm. And what we know about lions is, and hyenas, they're very fearful of lions, mm -hmm. okay? All the other animals are watching this lion because they know that the lion is not the biggest and the strongest in the kingdom, but they have a courage that is amazing. They have a strength and there's a level of respect for that king, that lion. And so what ends up happening mm -hmm. is now that lion is in the wilderness, that lion is in the wild, and that lion does nothing when the hyenas come by. The lion doesn't mm -hmm. go after its prey. It looks for dry food to eat. And, and, and mm -hmm. the other lions, excuse me, other lions are walking by saying, what is going on? Right? <laughs> We can see this is a senior lion because it has cold, you know, um, and and uh, and you can see this is a scene. But what is happening? This lion now is free, but because he had been taught not to be free, not mm. to be courageous, not to be the king, he doesn't move. He doesn't become what he's destined to become. 
And mm-hmm. so the question is using that example, what does oppression do psychologically, psychologically to people? It restricts them. Mm. It gives that self-fulfilling prophecy that if you say to a child that you don't, you cannot read, you, you're not capable of learning, then that child will grow up believing that they're not capable of learning. And so what it does psychologically, it decreases their level of confidence, it decreases their level of self-esteem. Mm-hmm. Do, they don't realize their potential. Mm-hmm. And what they do is they consistently harm themselves. Mm-hmm. And when I say harm themselves with the verbal, the emotional thoughts, the b- words that say you're not good enough, you're not capable enough, you're not empowered enough, who do you think you are? You want rights? No, you don't deserve it. So now the oppressor is no longer on the outside of them externally. The oppressor is intrinsic, it's within them, Mm -hmm. right? It goes from the outside, now it's on the inside. And so now the oppressor no longer have to beat them, no longer have to say you're stupid and you're dumb and you're not smart enough. The oppressor walks away and says, you do it now. Now you Mm. have your own oppressor. And so psychologically, it kills that person, just like the lion has been killed. Mm-hmm. And eventually that lion is now become not the predator, but now the prey. Mm. Mm-hmm. Does that, does that absolutely, make sense? Yeah, I absolutely love your analogy because it has so much depth to it, like just unpacking that and just thinking about that in my mind. Because also mm-hmm. something that just came to my mind you were speaking was oppression creates oppression because like like you were saying because all you've ever known in your life is oppression you're going to go out and oppress other lions for example because you think that lions should act in the way that you've been taught to think and you also not live in your fullness of of what your design is I, i think i think your your analogy summed it up very beautifully um and it also leads perfectly into the next question. Um, How does oppression, my next question was going to be, how does oppression affect the mind's ability to pursue slash have belief in achieving greatness? But I feel like your analogy really um, answered the question. Do you have anything else to add on to that or? Well, I mean, you you know, Tanache, I mean, we, we know the answer. We know the answer. We know that it, it leads to your inability to become and maximize what God has called you to be. It it, it minimizes your your trajectory of life. It minimizes it. It's like you know, it's it's like being able to say you know um, that th- this is this is another example, and I, I'm trying to remember. It is about a um, an ant. Oh, that's it. It's about an ant, right? And my son brought this mm-hmm. to my attention, right? He said that, you know, ants, if they don't have ants, if they don't have the ability, because what ants will do is if you put a cup over an ant, the ant will, you know, mm-hmm. just go in circles. But if you take the cup off of the mm-hmm. ant, what happens? The ant doesn't know what to do because it's been so oppressed for a very long time. I mean, I like my and I like my lion analogy better than my son's analogy about the ant. But yeah, I like also, this one as well. <laughs> but you know, it really is. It 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 limits you know that individual from becoming their best self and and not understanding their capabilities. And 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 so, how do you break out of that? And and I'm not sure if that's your next question. How do you break out of those mental? Yeah, it's leading there, but I, I think you're the queen of analogies because I think that analogies you're using just really spell beautifully what actually happens because we've seen this with America, for example. We've seen it with Africa. The cup has been lifted off the ant and they, they really don't know what to do. They don't know what direction to go. And that's why we've allowed the oppressor to continue oppressing us. So to 
continue giving us direction of where we should go. In Africa, for example, the very same people that oppressed us come in the form of donor agencies and say they, they would like to give us help. That's an entirely different conversation for another day, but I feel like it, it really spells out beautifully moving in circles as people of color and just um, black people particularly, and also people on the continent, because you know we were given our freedom and all of a sudden we really don't know what to do with it. So my next question for you is, how can good mental health transform oppressed people? Oh, I, I love these questions. This is so good. You are, you're amazing Karate, with these things. You know, because they're not just surface-based questions, but they are truly, um, they're truly hitting below the surface, looking at uprooting the root of why things have become the way they've become. And so as it relates to mental health and the oppression, right, you know, how, how, does, how does mental health support those who have been oppressed? I'm, I'm basically saying it in my own terms. Am I correct in saying that? How, mm -hmm. how does mental health support those mm -hmm. who have been oppressed? You know, I often mm -hmm. say that, you know, there are, okay, you know, and I, it's interesting enough because I, I, I have therapy clients in my practice. And today, I, I, you know, I had clients this afternoon um, and this morning. And one of the things that one of my clients had asked just today, maybe about 20 minutes before I got on this call, because I had to finish up with my clients. It was, how do I move forward now? How do I move forward? And I said to them that there are stages of grief. Hmm. And grief is no is not always the loss of a physical being or person. Mm -hmm. so grief is about the loss of dreams and aspirations. The, the loss of dreams and aspirations. And so there are five stages, which I often say there's six, right? And and if you don't mind, mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just tell you what those are if you don't mind. And that yes, will give please. you a Clearer of pity, right? Because when you're talking about those who've been oppressed, when you're talking about those who've been oppressed, you're talking about being able to say, "I have dealt, I have dealt with dreams that I wanted to go after, but I couldn't because I've been so locked up. I couldn't, mm -hmm. so I feel grief as a result of the loss." Mm -hmm. Okay, and so the first stage of grief and loss is first, there's a denial that happens. No, I have not mm -hmm. been oppressed. No, what are you talking about? Right, that's not true. That's your. That's what you think. We're, we're, we're mm -hmm. free, See, look, we're free. We have those shackles, mm -hmm. right? So there's that denial. But once you move from denial, then you move to oftentimes in the stage of grief, is that you move towards levels of anger because now you're feeling angry mm -hmm. that you have been oppressed, mm -hmm. okay? And then after the anger stage of feeling is the bargaining. Well, no, that's not true. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't oppressed. Oh, no, I'm angry. And going back and forth or being mad at your creator for being in the position that you're in or mad at everyone else. Mm -hmm. Then you have the fourth stage is depression. Mm -hmm. Right, you have that that depressed mm -hmm. feeling of oh my gosh, I've now moved from denial. I now accept, you know, I now see it for what it is. I'm angry about it. I am now no longer just angry. I'm bargaining back and forth. Now I'm actually depressed, and now uh -huh. it's it's now it's sunken in about where I've been and what mm -hmm. has happened. Then. After the depressed mode, you have this level of acceptance, right? Mm -hmm. That you must accept, like this is where you are. But I say there's a sixth stage, and that stage is being able to forgive. Forgive mm -hmm. the oppressor, but more importantly than forgiving the oppressor is forgiving yourself. 
Mm -hmm. Forgiving yourself and saying that I did not do anything about it, right? Because some oftentimes people in, internally take on guilt. I should have mm -hmm. done something, I should have done this. Mm -hmm. And so now when you're talking mm -hmm. about mental health and, 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 and those who have been oppressed, it is being mm -hmm. able to go through these stages and say to them that it's okay to feel what you have felt, but now let's move towards progress of mm -hmm. uh, no just where I was, and where I am, but where do I want to now go? Right? So you have to first be in touch with what has happened to you. you have to be first in touch with what, what has happened to your, your people. And then and mm -hmm. internally make a decision that I'm now getting the help that I need. I now am okay with where I was, even though I'm angry about it but it has caused me to become now this better person. This person that, you know, this person that really, you know, has it together, but it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight, it's a process. Does that, does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And even just while you were speaking, I found this very interesting because like this year I started um, seeing seeing like a counselor therapist and it, it like it, it's really helped me a lot. But during one of our sessions, I realized something because, you know, like I said, I'm very passionate about the development of Zambia and of, and of Africa. And she highlighted something about how I needed to get to a point where I forgave the people that oppressed us. And I, I think a lot of us who've been oppressed and who are passionate about, you know, fighting for freedom and, and whatever it is, um, have not forgiven the people that have done us wrong. And, you, you know, even just as you were speaking about the different stages of, of um, grief, a lot of us are stuck at the anger stage with, so because we're stuck at the anger stage, we can't heal and we're never going to get to a point where we develop for as long as we just stay angry at our oppressors and we just stay angry at our colonizers. So we need to go through all the stages and get to a point, like you said, where we forgive because uh, unforgiveness really clouds you. It, it clouds your judgment and it makes you do foolish things. So rather than us be focused on now developing our continent or our country, we are focused on getting even. And that that actually drains us. And um, I guess that's one of the, the reasons why um, Nelson Mandela, for example, is such a, a celebrated and respected person because he got to a point where he realized, okay, I've been done so much wrong, but if I now go in, if I go on a um, quest to get blood and to have my pound of flesh, it will tear all of us apart. Like as they say, you know, when you when you seek revenge, dig two graves. Um, yeah. So I think that that, that we keep falling into it, the grave that we're digging for ourselves as we're seeking revenge from our oppressors. So I think what you what you said is very profound. Um, but can I add that said? not easy sure please go ahead okay so what i found and what i in uh, observing is that it has mm -hmm. become there's two parts to this it has become how could i say this okay and accepted to be mad to mm -hmm. be angry. right it's like that if, if you're not angry then what's wrong with you then, mm. then, you're not angry. then the second part to that piece is it's no longer okay let's forgive or even they never entertain the level of forgiveness because the 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 the, the it's important to stay in that angry phase because that anger phase creates momentum. It creates levels of adrenaline, which causes you to act mm -hmm. and, and do and um, and make change. So you have to be angry in order for these things to happen because anger builds this level of strength. Little do they know they are killing themselves from the inside out. 
And so there's those, there's that, that two piece that's connected that if you're not angry, then you are okay with how you've been treated. But Nelson Mandela is the epitome of forgiveness. Whoa, whoa, the epitome. Are you still there? I think I'm not sure if I lost you. But he is truly the epitome of success. I, I, I hope that I hope that your viewers are gaining something from this. I hope that your viewers are gaining something from what I've just shared because it is important to have this discussion, to have the conversation around forgiveness. And let me say this, forgiveness is not an easy task. It really isn't. It is not an easy task. It is a task that takes lots of courage to do because now you're saying I'm putting down my armor. I'm still protecting myself, but I'm mm -hmm. putting down my armor and I'm not going to fight you. I'm going to love you, but I'm also going to be very careful. Mm. So there's, it, there's some strategic methods there because forgiveness does not mean that you're weak. Mm -hmm. Cause that's also the, 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 the that, that's the, that's the hidden message, right? That there is, if you forgive, then you're weak and you're okay with how they treat exactly. you. But forgiveness is really about finding peace and being able mm -hmm. to say, this is what has happened to me. I forgive you despite whether you apologized or not. Mm. And I think, oh my. Mm. Go ahead, go ahead. To, to show no, you. Please, 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 please. No. Please proceed. Yeah. Oh, I could be on. I could be on a roller coaster. That you know. And I'm gonna be honest with you. You know, I love these dialogues, and I. And I'm gonna be honest. I never read your questions that you sent me. <laughs> no. Wow. I never. No, but did. you're answering beautifully, honestly speaking. Because I love you're them. answering them like like you prepared for them. No, mm -mm. I never, when, when I'm asked to be interviewed, you know, the outlet may send me some questions in advance. So there's a level of preparation. I, I love having true, authentic, genuine discussion. And I love mm -hmm. being surprised about the questions because when I'm on a roll, I'm on a roll. So I just know me, right? So I don't, I don't have to prepare when it and comes. You're on a roll right now. <laughs> yeah, and, and the thing is, is that I'm passionate about mental health. I'm passionate mm -hmm. about people becoming their best self. I am passionate about people financially becoming wealthy because you know what I know for sure is that we're all given the same, same amount of skill set and tools built within us because our creator is only just one. Mm. It's just one. And so for me, having to read a question and before and write answers down, that's too much work. I, <laughs> I love being able to really authentically answer your questions and, and mm -hmm. give you true passion about the topics that's being discussed. And when you throw in mental health and all and etiquette, and that's all up my alley. I'm like, oh, I yeah. Got <laughs> so I'm sorry that disappointed you that I didn't read the questions, but I No, didn't. it's fine because I think you're you're answering them perfectly. And I was just going to say that you were you are dropping so many gems, like you're saying so many profound things. Um you know, like you were just talking about forgiveness and how forgiveness isn't easy. And I know this because I think I've also, I've struggled with forgiveness in different areas of my life. But one thing that I've learned is forgiveness is more about you than it is about other people because it's a weight. There's a quote I came up with um, some years ago. It's like, forgiveness is pouring um, acid on yourself is like forgiveness is like unforgiveness sorry is like acid and it's like pouring that acid on yourself and expecting the other person to suffer because you're pouring acid on yourself because it really does make you bitter and it just reduces the quality of life and i came across a quote um i don't know where i read this but it said the pain halves or, or the pain is cut in half 
when you decide to forgive. And that's so true. So I think as a people, we really need to get to a point where we forgive and we let go of what we don't need to carry. Because like you said, I think our oppression has made us smarter. Forgiveness doesn't mean we should continue to get oppressed. It just means that we should rid ourselves of an, an unnecessary weight that we are carrying. Something you said earlier was, anger has become the acceptable standard and anger has become the default reaction. And if you're not reacting in anger or you, you're not enraged, it doesn't lead you to want to break or distract property, then you're not affected or you don't care about the issue as much. And I feel that our, that anger really dilutes a lot of meaningful work that we could be doing because we are so focused on letting anger out. We're so focused on getting even. We're so focused on proving a point that we're not doing meaningful things. And this this takes us right back to the conversation, to the beginning of the conversation where we you gave an example of the civil rights movement where there was a boycott. Um, uh, and it actually led to some meaningful change. But when all you are is angry, it leads us to this um, cycle where we constantly wait for an issue to happen and we react out of anger. And then we calm down, we simmer down. Then again, an issue happens and we react out of anger and we, we are in a, a complete, we're, we're moving around in circles like the analogy of the ant that you gave and we're not actually doing anything meaningful. Um, yeah, I, I really love what you've said. Like, I think you've said some very profound things. And like you say, I hope the people that are watching this now and who are going to watch later are going to take out something meaningful from this. Because um, I think, again, it goes back to the whole thing of even within our local context, for example, we have things like tribalism that are keeping us from being underdeveloped. And sometimes some of these tribal conflicts they, there is a lot of bitterness involved. And some of these people did do us wrong, but how we, we shouldn't keep carrying on some of these e ethnic wars and these ethnic issues because they're actually impeding us from doing what we need to do. We, what we need to be focused on is being developed, creating a decent standard of living for everyone. But if we're so focused on getting retribution and you know getting even, we're never ever going to do the work that's required. Absolutely. I, I think that you, that was well said. Mm. Well said. So, right. mm -hmm. Please go ahead. No, no, that's, that's that, absolutely. I mean, I am in total agreement with you. Like you're not able to, you know, move strategically ahead because your mind is cluttered and your mind is clouded with anger. Right. And then mm -hmm. once you simmer down, I love how you said simmer down. Once you, now it has calmed down. What ends up happening is it's like, okay, what do I do now? Mm. What do I do now? Because I mean, if we've watched boxers, right? People who are in the ring and they're boxing, then what they would often say is that a boxer, okay, I'll go with another analogy. <laughs> so, yes, please. <laughs> but what and but this is factual that a, that a boxer never should go into the ring angry. Because if mm. you're going into a ring, angry because you know how they do the you know the advertising for the, the fights and they're like in each other's face and they're like i'm going to hurt you and your mother and your children i'm going to eat them you know like but they go back and forth right but that's all for that's all for promotion right that's just that's just part of the the promoting of the the actual event but quickly mm -hmm. if you were to go into a ring angry you're going in like uh, uh, but you're not strategically moving. And so it's so important to have a clear mind because again, clarity allows you to think before responding. Clarity allows you to move in a way that is quick, mm. and analytical. Mm. And that's why they call boxing the science. Mm. is a science is being able to see what works if if he hits me to the left should i right you know and should i do should i do, what what should i do but if you're angry you're not strategically thinking and so as i relate that to what you were saying about you know oppression and and those who have been oppressed and that it's and there is this is this 
okay, like it's okay to be angry, but are you really getting anything done? Mm -hmm. Are you strategically planning how to move mm -hmm. in a way that is going to cause accomplishment, success, growth? Well, are you really moving in that way? Or are you allowing your anger to be the, the driver in that seat as opposed to the backseat driver, the person in the backseat, the, mm -hmm. the backseat or the passenger? Because you don't want anger to be the driver because the, if the anger is the driver, it's going to crash eventually. Definitely. And like you're saying, that's what we see with a lot of with some of these movements and with some of these endeavors, because the, the driving force is anger and not development or not progression. Um, so just as we begin to wind down our conversation, what are some good mental health uh, practices that you can suggest? Well, you know, I often say that when you're talking about strategies and techniques, mm -hmm. right? The first thing is to say, it's okay to feel how you feel. Mm. It's okay to feel angry. Yes, as we're talking about anger. It's mm. okay to feel angry. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to, because these are natural emotions. That also you should not beat yourself up for feeling mm -hmm. those things. And I mean, I can't stress this enough. Do not hold it in. If you have reservations about talking to someone because there's a level of you, you don't level of mistrust from whatever has happened mm -hmm. in the background, find a way to release it. I always use here. I go with another mm -hmm. right. I always use you know with my clients, and I'll say this liquid inside of this water bottle is it's 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 soda, right? It's not just water, it's soda, right? And if I were to shake you up, right? If I were to shake you up and eventually open the top just like this, guess what happens? Everything gets spilled over because you're shaking up. But what I would say to my clients is that if you are soda in this bottle, what will mm. happen that little by little, if I just open up the top and screw it, little by little, you'll hear pss, pss, pss. and then eventually, once you finally open it, it doesn't explode. And so mm -hmm. I use this as an analogy to say to individuals is that if you have it's important to talk to someone, identify someone who's trained, whether it is your mm -hmm. pastor, whether it is your spiritual leader, whether it is mm -hmm. a mental health professional. Don't talk to your friends too much about it because your friends don't, your friends are going to tell you what to do. They're not really listening, right? Then <laughs> don't talk to your friends. Your friends will give you advice even when you don't even ask, right? So you want to, <laughs> and we know this for a fact. They mean well, but they really, they're not trained. They're not trained, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to talk to professionals, but if you have reservations about talking to someone, I say release it little by little. Find something that you, joy, whether it is art, whether it is drawing, mm -hmm. whether it is dance, whether it is giving back, find something that you can mm -hmm. do to release that level of sadness, Rel or even if it's you're writing it down and getting it out, because to hold it in is detrimental and mm -hmm. deadly to hold it in because eventually it has to come out. Just like when mm. we eat, it has, go so, it has to go somewhere. So you keeping stuff bottled up inside, inside becomes dangerous. And so mm. and with, with your viewers watching this today, if they don't hear anything that I said, I want them to hear this, is that it's vital mm. for you to get the help that you need because many of you are suffering even as we talk mm -hmm. right now. And when you don't get the help that you need, you become the oppressor. Mm -hmm. You become the person that you dislike because it makes you feel better. Mm -hmm. and, and so let me say this, I'm super duper excited. Like I, um, I am gonna be launching a course 
that Mm -hmm. talked about the whole person in September. And I'd love to come Mm -hmm. back to the show and talk more about that. But I yes, please. That would be nice. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And 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 possibly take questions from your from your viewers, Mm -hmm. right? Maybe do a webinar. And I and and truly this the, the, the course would be an online course for people around not just the US, but around the world. Because my goal is to be able to support people where they are, looking at their 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 outward appearance. We're gonna have fun. We do great, we're gonna be doing some great things about posture, poise, being able mm-hmm. to articulate yourself walking into a room, introductions. But then also we're gonna cover talking about mental health and emotional strength. Mm-hmm. And then also we're gonna be talking about entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. Being able to combine these three wonderful worlds mm. by creating this power person that you will become in, in order for you to become successful in your, in your niche, whether it is in your in your um, your development of other people, whether you are achieving specific goals and you want to get yourself together and be that example of strength empowerment, wisdom. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So I would love to talk to your viewers more about it, but it's going to be hitting on, it's going to be um, launching in September, the ending of September. I'm super duper excited, but I would love to come back and and give specific dates and get people enrolled in the course because it is something that you have never seen. As I say to my, my clients, you're going to be etiquette therapy, etiquette, uh, uh, um, What's the word? Ism, right? You're, you're, you're going mm-hmm. to, in this course, and in 30 days, you'll see differences in your behavior. You'll mm-hmm. see how you see the world and how you pursue what is in the world for you to take over. So, yeah. I absolutely can't wait um, to have you back and for us to speak like more into the course and hopefully we'll get a number of people to enroll in your course. Um, I love what you said and I just want to review and like paraphrase what you said in terms of um, p- good mental health practices. So you said we need to acknowledge the emotion and what we are feeling. Like it, it doesn't do us any good if we are in denial or if we, we, want to pretend like it's not there and then you also said we should not beat ourselves up for feeling the way that we're feeling or maybe for getting ourselves in a situation that has led to what we are feeling and then you you recommended talking to someone and um finding a way to release things if we can't talk to someone like we need to find a positive outlet and uh, even from what you said, like when you, when you gave examples of like what you do with the etiquette therapies, we have to find positive ways to find us, like uh, find ways to feel good. So for example, on a down day, I like to put on a face mask, get dressed up and because it, 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 you know, it, 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 it betters my mood. And even just from what you're saying, like certain things have, that have helped me over the years is maybe writing down my emotions rather than me angry with people. And I like I think this is some very practical help, and I'd like us to have like a further discussion because one of the things that I think we need to acknowledge as human beings is um, you were talking about emo- emotional strength. I think hardship or pain is an inevitable part of human life, so I think we need to get to a point where we have the the tools in our toolbox for when we encounter those situations. So if you're like most people will have like some sort of toolbox in their car or a spare tire. And they do that because they know that there might be an instance where they need to change this. They might need to do something. And we need to begin to do that in our own lives, develop certain tools for, you know, some of the mishaps that life hits us with. And it's because we, we don't go into life with that sort of mentality. We find ourselves in a circle, um, dealing with painful situations, like like you were saying, dealing with generational trauma, dealing with generational oppression, because we have not gotten to a point and realized like, wait, this pain is here, or these side effects of the oppression and colonization exist. How then in our personal day-to-day lives are we going to develop the psychological tools to begin to deal with this? So I absolutely love that. Yes. I have another question for you. Um, 
and this one is more generic just as we wind down like yes. and actually I'm loving this conversation because, because, to be this because I, pardon sorry I'm loving this dialogue that we're having me too um, and I think you've already answered this. So I'm going to skip this question. I was going to ask you, what are some of the implications of a positive mindset? But I think you've already answered this. You you spoke about how we live more holistic lives. We, we're we more charged towards our development agenda. We have, because we're not giving energy to the wrong things, we now have sufficient energy and even resources to give to positive things. So I think um, I have a question to ask you. And this stemmed out of a conversation with a friend who is actually our mutual friend. Um, do you think it's possible to be genetically wired towards failure? Okay, so that's a loaded question. So when you say mm. genetically wired towards failure, mm. can you elaborate on that? Because I don't want to miss, you know, I don't want to um, miss the point that, um, or the, the, the answer that you're looking for. Because that's okay. a very loaded question. Oh, I, I want, uh, and I'll use the African context, for example, okay. because we come from a generation of impoverished people. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible for maybe your DNA or your genetics to change and for us to get to a point where um, it almost doesn't matter what we do? There's something within our genetics that, that says that we will fail at whatever we try to do. Um, or is it more to do with a nurture thing? So uh, uh, maybe let me phrase it this way. Can failure become nature or second nature? Or is it something that needs to be nurtured into people? Um, not not believing in yourself, not believing in your abilities and stuff like that. Okay, so, okay, now I, under I understood your question the first time, but because it's a loaded mm -hmm. question, I want to be able to mm -hmm. respond in a way that, will support success, right? Because we don't want, one of the things that I don't ever wanna do, whether I'm on any platform, whether it's on a webinar, whether it is on a, a virtual interview or it's a face-to-face, -face, is that I don't want to support pessimism, right? Because many people do. I think that we as people do a better, a good job being down on ourselves, say that we are genetically <laughs> predisposed to it being failures, right? So I never want to do that, just if that makes sense, right? We, we want to keep it in, on an upbeat perspective. But scientifically, you know, what we know for sure is that people with mental health diagnoses, there mm -hmm. may be a predisposition to, to having mm -hmm. a medical diagnosis, a mental diagnosis. So I do want to express mm -hmm. that on that level because if someone has been family member has been diagnosed accurately definitively diagnosed with having bipolarism or severe mm -hmm. depression mm -hmm. genetically i should say there's a chemical imbalance and so what ends up happening is you end up having children right because it because it becomes a a genetic predisposition to gaining that that being mm -hmm. being being someone who's now diagnosed with having bipolar, right? Because the chances mm -hmm. are. And so, but it's very much like any type of medical. And I talked about this on my web, on my um, YouTube channel, which is, you know, Natasha Paris, Natasha Paris, mm -hmm. same as, right? On the go with Natasha Paris. And what I say, I've said is that there are people who are predisposed to having mental health issues. However, the light switch is turned off, but the light bulb is in the um, in the light socket. And so, what causes that to turn on is triggers, such as some post traumatic, some stress disorder, some traumatic events that they've experienced, which then turns it on, right? Which turns the switch on because you that light bulb had already been there. If that, if you're following what I'm saying. And so mm -hmm. just like someone who's, you know, been asked, well, have your mom and dad had a heart attack? Does that run in your family? The chances of you, you having a heart attack or having cancer becomes greater because of the genetic predisposition. 
Okay. But then mm -hmm. on the other side, you say, are we genetically, is there a genetic makeup? Are we pre-wired to becoming failures? And is it, is it nurture versus nature, right? You know, is it something that you've been taught or is it something that you, you, you've been born with? And mm -hmm. I'm embarrassed to say that in my, my, in my experience, when I see people who are failing at life, failing at life, tremendously, a great amount of it has to do with how they were raised, what they have been taught, what has been instilled in them. I wouldn't say that they're genetic, because you have, mm -hmm. you have you, but then you have exceptions to both rules. You have individuals who have parents who, who've been absentee, whether they were drug addicted, whether they were abusive, and that child, despite what has happened to them, they had the ability to move forward despite their surroundings, right? You know, they had the ability to, to, to move forward. So to answer your question in a, in a really simple manner, I truly believe that, no, I don't believe that people are genetically wired to be failures. I do believe that individuals, based on how they've been raised and what has been implemented and instilled in them, they can they can truly be successful. Um, and if it has been told that they will not be successful, there are people on both sides of the the, 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 the polar that will say, you know, this this child has been successful despite what was taught to them, or this child, regardless of what was taught to them, right? They still became failures. So, I, 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 but on the on the larger scale of things, on, on the, the greater scheme of things, is that it's really, really how and what has been implemented and instilled. In so that's that's just Natasha? my Natasha? heartfelt opinion. Natasha, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, okay. I, I didn't hear the last few sentences you said. Oh, it was okay. breaking. Oh, it was. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so what I was saying was is that on polar opposites for anything, right? There are, you know, um, children. If a child is being raised by individuals who are constantly implementing or um, pouring into them negativity or they've experienced negativity, there's this level of resilience. That's the word, the resilience that regardless of what was happening to them, they still were able to surpass and move past the negativity. But then you have on the other end of the spectrum, you have individuals. I don't, I don't know if the viewers are able to hear, but I can hear I heard you. something about resilience. Yes. But it's the line is getting really Maybe it's just my end then. Um, it's it's breaking really badly. I'm I'm hardly I'm I'm not. It's not. I'm not able to follow you. Okay. And your screen is frozen. I just hope that the viewers are able to. Hear. Sometimes oh, I, I might not be able to hear, but um, it's being presented correctly. Okay. Um. Okay. So someone says we can hear. They can hear. So please proceed. Sorry. Okay, so someone says, so so I'm going to re repeat this again, and I hope that you are able to hear me. Um, and so what I'm saying to you is to answer your question that they're on polar opposites, on the left and the right, they're always going to be a marginal of individuals, small amount of individuals that are able to res be resilient despite what is happening or despite the negative environment. Then you have individuals, despite the positive environment, they're, they're wired to you know, just be, you know, failures. But on the greater scheme of things, on the larger scheme mm -hmm. of things, mm -hmm. is that there, I truly believe in my experience of, of being in this industry for almost 18 years. I'm like, I hope I don't show it. <laughs> but but in, in this industry, of being in the industry for 18 years, what I found and I believe is that there are individuals, mostly individuals, based on how they were raised and what was supported like what was said to them right you know so if they're taught that failure is the norm and the chances of them becoming failures is a lot greater versus someone who hasn't experienced that and all they've been taught was you can do it you're great no matter where you live 
matter who you are, no matter what you look like, that you will be successful. All you have to do is believe it. All you have to visually see it, and all you have to do is believe it, and then you can achieve it. Mm. Did you hear what I said? Yes, I think I was able to to pick out some of the things that you said. And um, one of the things that I've gotten from that is what matters more is, um, or in my own words, is it, it, it has more to do with what people are told and what they're fed with. Because sometimes the mind is like, the mind or our ability is like a plant. And if you are giving that plant the right nurturing, the, the right kind of um, uh, nutrients, the plant will grow and it will thrive. But in the absence of that, the plant will be malnourished and it will eventually die. So um, even in instances where people might be born with, with certain dispositions or with certain disabilities that would have otherwise disadvantaged them. The type of nurturing and the type of environment that they're in will really determine um, how much success they have or how they thrive. Um, yeah. I think that that was all the questions I had. Are there any other things that you wanted to share with my viewers just as we conclude? Well, you know, I I mean, I, you've done a fantastic job. Let's give it back to our host, okay? <laughs> Tanasha. She she is awesome in what she does, and and the fact that she's bringing this to the to the to the limelight. She's bringing this to the stage and having real authentic um, discussion around everything that you've heard today. I mean, you know, I I just want to say thank you, thank you so much, Tanasha, for being that that vehicle. Right, being that outlet to support change, to support change, and it was my humble, humble um, delight to be present and, and available for your viewers, and and I hope that your viewers were able to gain as much as I did. Right, so the, just having this discussion was amazing. So I'm gonna give it back to you, and I just wanted to applaud you, Tanache for your efforts and your diligence and your commitment to the to the cause to the cause and wanting change and it starts with people like you so i i did want to give you acknowledgement and and just say that i was humbled to be you know present and available for your your viewers and and for you as well so thank you thank you so much Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule, Natasha. And I hope this won't be the last um, of no. our discussions because I feel like there's so much to unpack. Mm -hmm. I mean, regards to psychology, development, and um, you know, oppressed people and, and how to get more than anything. Because um, you took the lion out of the cage, but the lion his mind was still in an oppressed state. So if we are going to get people out of oppression, we have to focus more on the mentality of the people that were previously oppressed. Um, so I really, I'm really looking forward to having more discussions like this. And hopefully maybe we could one day discuss you um, designing a course for um, corrupt politicians or, or something like that, or people who've lived in countries that are corrupt to just help rehabilitate them. You know, the, that would be awesome. You know, there's no limit to what can be done. Um, and I think there really is a lot of work for people with your type of. You're breaking up. I, I can't hear you. Experience. I can't hear you. Um, and please I, keep doing what you're I, doing. I, I thoroughly enjoyed having this conversation. Tanasha, you're breaking up. I couldn't hear you. Hello? Can you hear me Hello? now? Yes. OK, so everything that you said, I didn't receive it. I, I didn't hear anything you said. Oh, OK, like at all. <laughs> mm -mm. Okay, um, I was just saying that I think there's so much work for people with your type of expertise. Um, at 
I, I just hope that you continue to just do the work that you're doing and, you know, um, just continue to expand your horizons because I think the world needs people like you also with your expertise to begin to rehabilitate the minds of oppressed people and people that think that um, development is not for them or thriving or whether it be, it be like personal success or economic success in their country uh, um, is not a possibility for them. They really need to begin to have their minds have rehabilitated because before you achieve anything, before you believe anything, it starts in your mind first. Um, so I hope we can start to give our, our minds the due care that they need. And thank you so much to everyone that has tuned in, anyone that will be watching this afterwards, everyone that has stayed with us from the beginning. I hope that this was really informative and you learned something. If you have anything to, to say, please drop us a comment before we let Natasha go and we end this live stream. Um, just let us know your thoughts. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you so much for having me. And, and this is recorded, so it'll be great. I'm sure you'll get more viewers watching the replay of this. And definitely, I would love to come back and really you know, create a chorus that will support those. And rehabilitation, I had never thought about that. But I think that that is mm -hmm. an excellent platform, being able to rehabilitate individuals and and give them a voice but more importantly letting them know that they're not alone they're not alone mm. we can collectively you know so cry together but then also support one another and pull each other up and say look i have been there because oftentimes people believe that they are the sole individual that has been through their only experience knowing and, and that's the scary part is you think that every everyone else is perfect and you're the sole individual that is imperfect but when you realize that there are mm. so many people who have dealt with what you dealt with and that you guys to, together can heal, then that's where the work begins. Because it says, you're not alone, mm -hmm. we're here to support you, we're here to help each other, and now collectively we heal, and then we progress. Mm -hmm. So yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. I love that, 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 that idea. And so I would love to come back and we can do some more work. But thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm, you know, I'm super duper excited, and, and the conversation and the discussion was, superb so thank you <laughs> thank you as well and i i also really enjoyed this enjoy the rest of your your afternoon and yeah it's it's nighttime on this side of the world yes um, but thank you so much. thank you so much bye guys thank enjoy you so much yeah. bye bye, -bye. bye.